Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as Mark was saying, uh, I'm not sure if you I'll talk about uh, a single object, but um, very much about the connections that it makes, the implications that it has for uh, spatial expression and uh, monumentality and so on. So uh, I'd like to start by sort of suggesting that the Olympic Games are perhaps not the perfect kind of ideological spatial event, but uh, one of, perhaps after the, the sort of exposition, uh, the one of the best ways that nation states uh, make co choreographed displays of uh, value and meaning through space uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so in, in, in their history they have, um, various Olympic Games have created some of the, the, the most naked monumental expressions of uh, architectural meaning that we find. So, I mean, a perfect example would be the kind of Berlin Olympics of 1936 as being this kind of showcase of Nazi architecture, perhaps. More so than Nuremberg, they, are, they were the kind of, uh, perfect expression of the sort of dominating neoclassicism of uh, the Nazis. Um, but then also, uh, the early 70s, 1972 in Munich, the, the Olympic uh, architecture there is, is, is technocratic, optimistic, it's environmentally conscious. It makes a very um, 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 strong statement of the zeitgeist there. And then, of course, in 2008, with uh, Beijing, with the, sort of these Western-designed extravagant buildings, um, they really kind of announced what, what the Chinese wanted to say was, you know, we are back, and very much the spatial expressions in those buildings were exactly that. So, Compared to that, the London Olympics, which are due to happen next summer, uh, have often appeared to be uh, cursed. Um, the, the Olympics were awarded to London in, on the 6th of July 2005, uh, and then the very next day, um, 50 people were, 52 people were killed in uh, terror attacks on the public transport system. So uh, nobody even had a chance to celebrate before um, the, the sort of the, the game was com the political game was completely changed in the country, uh, and now six years later, or it it will be six years later. It seems that the Olympics are going to be taking place in the middle of you know the most catastrophic political situation in the UK and you know since since the Second World War. So. Uh, it's very kind of interesting to, to posit what will eventually be seen to be the kind of historical meaning of this uh, of this event, and I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit about the Olympics and about kind of um, how they have come to be. Uh, the area that was chosen uh, for where London will have its Olympics is an area called the Lee Valley uh, along the river, which is an area of assorted light industry, kind of railway yards, uh, and generalised wasteland. Uh, it was a somewhat mythical uh, space in London, um, partly because of various sort of strange landmarks such as the Fridge Mountain and, 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 and things like that. But it also became quite well known through artists and writers and so on in the kind of London psychogeographical renaissance of the, of the late 1990s. Uh, and so it began to be depicted as this kind of psychically charged zone, um, general public mostly ignored it, but it was filled with kind of wonderful sights and histories and and then in a very well known process um, artists began to move into the surrounding areas which were very run down, very poor uh, and so they came home to the creative class and so on who at first mixed reasonably easily with uh, sort of working classes, ethnic minorities and even travellers who had their homes there but gradually, of course, uh, antagonisms rise, rent, and so on, and you ended up with a kind of situation of class cleansing, which uh, the Olympics has teleported itself into. Um, now, this is the Olympic site as it stands today. Uh, into that space, the, the London Olympics was, was to be created, looking at um, the example of cities such as Barcelona, uh, who in 1992 
managed to use the Olympics as an excuse for a massive regeneration and in infrastructural investment. So the kind of the idea that was sold is that after these games, London would be uh, left with some world class sports facilities, a large park where once was just kind of light industry, uh, and a number of new residential neighbourhoods. Um, but how that's been delivered is through massive public, so state expenditure, um, has been used as a kind of hook in, with, to, in, with which to bring the private sector in. So London now has uh, one of something like the third largest uh, shopping mall in Europe, which is um, seen in the middle of the of the image, and uh, and a variety of uh, new speculative uh, housing developments, um, luxury, of course, and the kind of tiny luxury that only London can can offer, um, and uh, which you see in the, in the foreground and so on. Um, so really it's been a kind of state investment in order to uh, make a hell of a lot of money for uh, private speculative uh, developers and so on. Now, uh, at this point I'll talk a little about the architecture that has made up the Olympics thus far. Uh, the, compared to the uh, the Beijing Olympic Stadium, the, the, which um, was designed famously by uh, Swiss firm Herzog and de Muron with uh, the artist Ai Weiwei, um, who was much more popular with the authorities at that point. Um, the, the London Olympics kind of knew that it couldn't compete with that uh, for simple reasons, that the cost of labour in China is much cheaper so they can build much more flamboyant things. Uh, the original design for the London Olympics was a fairly kind of generic, um, flamboyant thing, but that eventually became this. Um, uh, now this is by a, a, a British architect called Populous, um, and the way they tried to sell this, uh, this stadium, which is, you know, it looks pretty much like any, any stadium from about 40 years ago, the way they tried to sell this was, as a, they called it like an IKEA stadium, or a, or, or a flat pack. Um, partly because of its simplicity, because they couldn't really afford to do anything else, but also because um, the, the, one of the selling points of the Olympics was that it would be reduced in size afterwards, because you're never going to get that many people again using these stadia. So the, the way they tried to pitch this kind of cheapness uh, was um, as, a, as a kind of adaptable, uh, flexible kind of thing. Um, as you might imagine, the critical response initially was pretty negative, or was very negative. Um, the sort of the thriftiness of the design seemed to testify to how past its prime the United Kingdom was as a country, unable to spend enough money to, to create something interesting, uh, pathetic even, compared to what the Chinese were capable of doing. Um, but what's interesting is that since then, um, the, the, the now completed stadium, there's been a bit of a critical reversal. Uh, there's a sort of Sense people are beginning to sense that it's sort of elegant. It has it has a kind of hint of um, certain currents in British modernism from the 1970s of being lightweight, simple, functional, and 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 kind of tailored. Um, whether or not you agree with this, um, thing is, it's not cheap though because uh, one of the uh, it became massively expensive due to having to decontaminate the ground from uh, radioactive material that had seeped in there over the years of light industry and so on. So it's, I mean, it's, it's massive, it's, it costs so much more than this Chinese stadium did. Uh, uh, and, and, and so on. And at the moment in the UK we're going through a little period where, because the original intention was to sell it to a football club, one of the, one of the London football clubs. Um, and because two of them uh, have fought so um, viciously over who's going to get it, that it's, that deal has now collapsed, so it looks like they're now going, it's now going to remain in state hands, but will be rented to some football team, which means that the, ta the, the, sort of the public in the UK are going to be uh, saddled with, with paying for that even further. Um, of the second of three major uh, um, sports venues is the velodrome for the cyclists, and really there's not much to say about this. Um, it's elegant, uncontroversial, um, 
simple, and 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 that's how it's been received. It's like, oh, well done. It's very nice. Okay, um, competent at best, basically. Um, and then the other one is the aquatic centre, which is actually of relevance to what I'm going to discuss fully in a bit. Um, uh, designed by Zaha Hadid Architects, and it's a, a kind of potent example of the, of, of the attractions and the problems of the contemporary architectural mode of flamboyant, digitally designed architecture. Um, Zaha Hadid is, of course, one of the most acclaimed architects in the world. Um, after sort of decades in the wilderness working as a sort of quasi-artist, um, you sort of trying to sell her brand of architecture through painting and through things like that. Um, she's now these days builder of kind of vast ornate sort of symbolic trinkets for various uh, um, regimes across the world, and finally in in the UK. Um, it's very simple, but it's also ridiculously complex. Um, like so many twenty first century buildings that sort of purport to come from a radical culture. It's a simple, single, uh, formal idea that um, anyone could get. It's a, 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 what you might call a sight bite instead of a sound bite, in the words of uh, critic Jonathan Meese. Um, it's a big wave because there are swimming pools inside. <laughs> uh, that's the idea. Um, now, what, what's interesting is that to achieve this kind of uh, very simple idea has required the very latest in technology, very latest digital design software and so on. Uh, the structure above that weighs 10 times that of the velodrome that we just saw for an area that's similar to the area that's covering cost far more. It, it's a, a, incredibly wasteful for such a kind of simple object. And then as part of this kind of uh, flat pack Olympics idea, the, 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 this centre must reduce its capacity after the games have finished. But unlike the athletic stadium where this is built into the design from the outset, and, you know, the aquatic centre has had to build massive wings onto the side, um, which will accommodate the additional seating for the length of the Olympics. Now this is of course a massive problem because uh, spe uh, spectacular architecture of that kind is meant to present a seductive face to the viewer, and when more is this more important than during the two weeks of the Olympics? Um, so nobody's going to see it in its intended state, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of spending that much money on the building uh, in, in the very first place. So these were the three kind of objects that were going to make up the Olympics for a long time. But then all of a sudden something else popped up uh, out of almost nowhere. Uh, and to actually describe that I have to give a kind of because it's so intrinsically linked to the personalities that were part of this, I have to sort of talk about them. So um, this here is uh, Boris Johnson, who is currently the publicly elected mayor of London. Uh, he is uh, quintessentially of the British elite in society. He was educated at Eton College, famously, and Oxford University, uh, where he was a member of the infamous uh, vandalising uh, drinking club, the Bullingdon Club. Um, he is, needless to say, a conservative. Uh, he's known for being thuggishly right-wing, uh, but in a very kind of old-fashioned British way, you know, uh, kind of uh, in a kind of patrician sense. Um, uh, he's well. He's one of the most well-known personalities in British political life. He's known for his unruly appearance, uh, his clumsy demeanour, and his apparent stupidity, um, which masks his kind of utter, utterly ruthless ambition, and so on. So. It, it's this kind of ambitiousness and desire to be liked that led him to the idea of creating a large uh, piece of public art for the Olympics. Um, and he cooked up this idea, but it didn't seem to go anywhere. Um, but until there was a serendipitous moment at um, the World Economic Forum, and I'll read you a quote from Johnson here. He said, after 18 months of construction on the site, and that's of the other buildings, we knew that we didn't have any cash, but we would need a prodigious quantity of steel. I was racking my brains to think of anyone I knew who had large quantities of steel. In Davos, in the cloakroom, who should I bump into but Lakshmi Mittal? We'd never been introduced before. It wasn't a 60-second conversation, it was a 45-second conversation. I framed the idea, which took about 40 seconds, and he immediately said, I'll give you the steel. <laughs> 
okay, now this is Lachlan uh, Mittal, he's the sixth the richest man in the world with a fortune of well over 30 billion US dollars. His steel business, ArcelorMittal, is well known for an appalling safety record, uh, numerous deaths everywhere, um, avoidable deaths as well, uh, mass redundancies, closures of steel, um, steel industries, entire countries he destroys the steel industries, as well as being dumped for price fixing. Uh, he's been involved in a number of scandals, he's a UK resident. Uh, he was involved in a scandal of, for purchasing uh, political influence uh, involving former Prime Minister Tony Blair and uh, Mittal's attempt to buy, buy the, the entire Romanian steel industry in one go. Uh, and so, as we now know, uh, Mittal agreed to funding and supplying, uh, supplying the steel for the sculpture that Johnson was planning in exchange for it being named after his company, which is itself named after him. Um, so now that cash and material was forthcoming, there's a matter of what this monument's going to be. So they had a design competition in 2009 that went nowhere, and they just didn't like any of the, the submissions. So instead, they drew up their own shortlist of, of possible designers, um, which apparently included the British sculptor Anthony Gormley, who you may know, uh, who proposed a uh, sort of 100 metre high sculpture of himself, of course, <laughs> uh, which didn't happen. Uh, and of course the winners who were eventually decided were uh, Anish Kapoor and Cecil Balmond. Now Anish Kapoor is one of the world's most successful sculptors. Um, he occupies that strange contemporary space where he's effectively a, a, a kind of architect in many ways. He has a design practice of course. Uh, his budgets reach into the millions of, 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 of dollars. Um, now his work uh, in the public realm is what I would call um, fireworks art. So uh, by that I mean it's, it's, a, it's a kind of work that presents some kind of uh, universally interesting visual effect, such as a curved mirror or, or kind of um, something large, usually a massive scale, um, for example, something like this. Um, and the only response you can have to that is a kind of very banal, sort of, ooh, uh, that's nice. Um, it's a kind of really diet sublime, um, it's, it's culture without any kind of intellectual content, uh, and it's frequently used in kind of urban regeneration and other such kind of political uh, spatial strategies. They'll usually break down the budget, give someone like Anish Kapoor five million dollars or whatever, and you know, culturally brand what they do. Uh, and Cecil Bond, uh is the world's most famous structural engineer. Uh, until recently, he was one of the chairmen at Arup, who are the world's most important engineers, where he built a reputation for experimental and innovative work with various contemporary architects. Uh, he's rare uh, because his name is often associated with his project, um, and he famously draws inspiration from you know fractals and mathematics, Bach, and, and, and so on. Um, <laughs> you, you know, like you know the kind of the list. Um, and he's been an important driving force in the development of the kind of flamboyant global architecture that Zaha Hadid is the most <coughs> significant example of. Um, unfortunately, these days, unlike Anish Kapoor thinking that he's uh, an architect, uh, Cecil Balmond these days thinks he's a sculptor. Um, and so he has some large public art commissions under his own name. Uh, this is one that's proposed for the border between Scotland and England, which is supposedly going to be about 60, 70 metres high. Um, so, vulgar, vulgar. Um, so, after introducing these people, it's worth, uh, I'll just recapitulate that what we're going to be talking about is a sculpture that's been created on the whim of a, a single politician, it's been funded by and is erected in honour of a borderline corrupt billionaire, and uh, has been created by two members of, of the recently formed public art elite. Okay, so, um, Here's an image uh, of, the, of it being unveiled. Uh, the, the lady there is Tessa Jowell of the now defunct New Labour movement, um, or hopefully defunct. Um, so if, if we can avoid the form for just a minute more uh, and just describe what the, what the tower will do for London, um, it's 115 metres high. Uh, it has a two-storey viewing platform at the top, well, near the top, uh, from which the viewer will get a view of the Olympic Park and a, a prospect over London. Uh, and then they have the opportunity to walk back down a spiral staircase. Now this is in itself fairly simple. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a very difficult engineering task. 
task. Um, people have done it for hundreds, of, well, yeah, well, well over a hundred years. They've been able to design towers with staircases in them and a viewing gallery. Um, and you've even managed to do them with revolving restaurants, you know, at a much greater height. So, um, but what marks the orbit out is its form, its, its shape. And what is this shape? So it's twisted, or it appears to have been twisted, because obviously it, 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 it's not a ribbon, uh, although it would like to appear as one. It's a web of tubular sections of steel arranged in such a way to give the impression of being a loop or a ribbon. Uh, the very vague formal quality of the, of the structure have allowed nearly everybody who has looked at the building uh, or the design to come up with their own reading. So I, I can't even begin to, to describe some of the things it's been described as. It's a, a trombone, a broken trombone, uh, someone's intestine, uh, a roller coaster, uh, people have claimed to see the Olympic rings kind of melted within it and so on. What, what, what's going on here is that the kind of folds and twists have no significance of their own. Uh, they behave in a kind of elusive manner. So they hint at all manner of kind of aesthetic connections. Um, this is a very common a a aspect of uh, contemporary spatial expression. Um, rapid increases in technological capability have allowed buildings to become ever more exuberant without necessarily, uh, without symbolic capabilities managing to keep up. Um, now, one of the qualities of the object is that it's, um, it's essentially scaleless. Uh, I don't think that Anish Kapoor probably had any idea how big this would be, I, I, um, because as they were developing it, they would only have seen it either as this little scribble or on the screen of a, of a computer that was working it out. So, so you've got a doodle, uh, a sort of lazy doodle, that has been turned into a, a digital shape, which is then translated into a buildable structure by some very advanced computer software. Uh, this is becoming more and more parad paradigmatic by the day, uh, as the so-called vanguard of architecture resort more and more to this kind of uh, creating shapes that are then resolved down by engineers into buildable structures. So this is it uh, now. Uh, so it's almost complete. Um, now, one of the things that's most egregious about it is it's, it's kind of it's complete intellectual weakness. Um, I'd like to read you a, a portion of the artist statement from when it was being when it was being unveiled. Okay, so the quote starts. Uh, the design for Orbit evolved out of a dialogue between Anish Kapoor and Cecil Balmond. The artists started their creative investigation by looking at the idea of the tower in the 21st century. It should be a landmark sculpture, and to be decide, defined as such, it will provide panoramic views over London. Post the post 2012 games, it should retain its iconography against the London skyline. It should make an iconic statement about towerness. <laughs> they looked at epoch-making towers such as the Eiffel, Tatlin, Empire State, and even the pyramids. They could see that all conventional or classical structures want to accumulate strength and are thus stable, ground-based structures. Furthermore, all towers are continuous in the vertical plane. <laughs> this was a premise which Kapoor and Balmond wished to unravel and destabilize. Okay? So, I mean, so not only does the orbit make an iconic statement, um, you know, it, it makes an iconic statement perhaps purely about its own capacity to be iconic, um, and of course, iconic being more or less the last adjective that anyone can use to describe architecture anymore. Um, but apparently it's also some kind of deconstruction of your typical phallocentric tower structure. And, and it's, to be honest, it's not alone in public art. It seems that the dominant kind of language for public art these days is this kind of, um, a kind of haze of mock Derridean thought, uh, kind of <laughs> endlessly challenging received notions and expectations of, of what something ought to be and, you know, kind of redefining the boundaries of something or other without actually um, doing anything. So yes, it's vacant, um, but I think it would be a good idea to look at the historical comparisons that they've made. So 
there's a number of reasons why the Eiffel Tower is looked at as an example. Uh, the first and most obvious would be what, that it's one of the most loved vertical landmarks anywhere in the world. Um, who wouldn't want to compare their tower that they were building to that particular Parisian icon? But the Eiffel Tower has been evoked many times uh, in relation to the thorough drubbing that the orbit received critically from more or less everyone who were just you know, up in arms about something so hideous. But what's happened now is that people have started invoking the famous um, letter that uh, Guy de Montpasson uh, and various others signed, where they said, and I quote, writers, painters, sculptors, architects, passionate lovers of the heretofore intact beauty of Paris, we come to protest with all our strength, with all our indignation, in the name of betrayed French taste, in the name of threatened French art and history, against the erection in the heart of our capital of the useless and monstrous Eiffel Tower, which the public has scornfully and rightly dubbed the Tower of Babel. Um, now this is the basic rhetoric which is going on here when people invoke this, you know, everyone hated the Eiffel Tower. Uh, because it was originally despised and gradually became a most treasured monument, then the vitriol that is expended against the orbit is a sure sign that the, bit, that the orbit is going to become a landmark as loved as the Eiffel Tower, uh, which, you know, is a complete fallacy. You can't make that comparison uh, logically. Um, but further, um, we should make a, a more interesting uh, comparison with the Eiffel Tower in terms of technological demands of the day. So we should note that when the Eiffel Tower was built, it literally doubled the height of the tallest structure in the world. Uh, so it was twice as high as anything humans had ever built. And it remained the tallest thing that humans had ever built for another 40 years almost after it had been built. I and mean, we can't really imagine that length of time elapsing between the tall buildings now. And when it was built, it really was the very limit of what was possible with engineering. And it marked a step forward in, in, in humankind's capabilities. Now, in a sense, this is also true about the orbit, into, for it also relies upon the most advanced technology that the people have in order to realise its complexities. But let us bear in mind that the Eiffel Tower is three times the height of the orbit. So the orbit is neither a kind of revolution nor an evolution, but it's a, more of an involution. Uh, its complexity, the orbit's complexities, its counterintuitive engineering and its formal and structural redundancies um, cannot be considered a great leap forward, uh, and I'll come back to that. Um, the, there's a more fruitful comparison might be with the Statue of Liberty, which of course was also engineered by Gustave Eiffel. So these two um, uh, structures are, are, are very interestingly linked. Um, because in method, this is far more similar to the orbit. Um, its engineering seeks not some kind of rationality and efficiency, but is working in a sec secondary position to an overarching formal idea. <clears throat> uh, but of course, the Statue of Liberty is fully laden with all kinds of cultural meanings, symbolisms, ideologies, whereas all of the orbit seems to signify is its very own um, capacity to, to be significant. Um, so all, we could almost say that the, the orbit appears to be awaiting some kind of figurative skin. Uh, and there's a lot to... There's an argument that you can make um, about the kind of abstraction that has taken hold in, in, in much public art about um, what it's actually doing, and, um, but not here. And so another comparison that we kind of you have to make uh, is, of course, to the monument to the Third International. Uh, this is both the most obvious and also the most difficult comparison. Um, the superficial similarities, you know, both are a deep red colour. Both feature twisting steel structures housing uh, more rudimentary internal buildings. Um, although, of course, the, 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 symbolism, the symbolism in the monument is, of course, quite reasonably explicit in the sense that it evokes the dialectical method spiraling off into infinite synthesis. Um, but interestingly, uh, I'd like to talk about. Uh, uh, resonance that was highlighted um, by a Bulgarian artist um, called Petko Durmana, uh, who created a multimedia installation at the Tallinn Museum of, of Modern Art uh, entitled Freestanding, which juxtaposed the orbit and the Tatlin's tower under another banner. Um, and uh, his work, uh, this is part of his work. Um, 
I'll quote from his press release. Um, Freestanding invites audiences to compare two towers. Tatlin's monument to the Third International was never built, but became one of the most recognisable examples of the constructivist movement and is one of the symbols of modernity in the early 20th century. Arcelor Metal Orbit, designed by Anish Kapoor for the Olympic Games in 2012, is under construction and is expected to become a landmark of London. Almost a century divides the two projects. Huge changes in technology and society took place in that time, but the change in the political need of such symbols of progress and power is scant. Reduced to a virtual representation of mobile phones, ArcelorMittal Orbit justly serves its purpose of being a monument to recession. Now, Germana's comparison is quite sophisticated. Uh, famously, Tatlin's tower was to be 400 metres high and demanded more steel than the Soviet Union was in any, uh, at all capable of, of producing. Um, it was, when it was designed, and it was still going through the brutal civil war, of course. Um, and of course, the orbit is being constructed at a time where Europe is on the very verge of collapse, as we know. Um, but the orbit is indeed being built, despite its complexities. It's not necessarily a monument to recession, but to the, kind of, uh, the gross inequalities and capricious wealth of its patrons. So now I'd like to just kind of try and bring these strands together uh, with the kind of idea about what these kind of engineering uh, and formal uh, expressions mean. So in the century long period uh, between the very first experiments in iron construction and the Paris Exposition of 1889, where the Eiffel Tower was, the limits of engineering were continually being pushed back with bigger spaces, wider spans, higher routes, uh, there were brand new architectural problems that had to be solved, uh, often generated by the rapid industrialization, sorry, rapid urbanization in industrialized economies, and the accompanying infrastructural developments such as railways and other distribution networks. The level of discovery and development at this period was such that it would have been very difficult not to perceive a sense of limitless progress as the boundaries of human structural achievement were regularly and frequently uh, refined and surpassed. So this straining, the straining against limits uh, that gave rise to the, the functionalist narrative that dominated modern architecture, this reached its apotheosis in the 1889 exhibition. The Eiffel Tower was the tallest structure in the world, uh, the Washington, doubling the height of the Washington Monument, uh, with just the barest of uh, programmatic usefulness. So just as the functionalist narrative was coagulating into something, we reached the point where instead of new engineering achievements being catalyzed, catalyzed by programmatic demands. In 1889, the engineers now started setting challenges to human culture in that their abilities were now greater than what, uh, what society needed of them. They could make a box, they could make a, a building for you that was any size, basically, in effect. Uh, so, um, so the kind of heroic reciprocity that defined the beginnings of modernist architectural culture were now at a, effectively at an end. Um, so we should understand that in 1889 what passed was the ability of culture to give proper challenges to engineers and constructors. Um, it is, it's the initial moment of failure in functionalist narratives. It's a period where structural achievement begins to cause a form of alienation whereby human abilities were no longer capable of forcing structural discoveries. The only limits now are economic ones and Aestheticization of structure would, from this point on, always be attendant, um, although disavowed to a greater or lesser extent. Now we should also note that contemporary architecture and spatial expression, including sculpture, is so resolutely dependent upon its engineering processes and prowess. Uh, and the orbit is perhaps the most pure example of this yet to be constructed. Uh, it's supposedly the inheritor of a functionalist narrative. You, as, as, as shown, you only need to look at the press release to realise that structural virtuosity is one of its only selling points when people are discussing it. But something strange has occurred in the last 120 years. The attitude to engineering has become something it wasn't before. What you have now is, is what's called the re resolved shape, or what I would call the resolved shape mode of design. An architect or a sculptor, genius, comes up with a form that looks spectacular when mocked up by a computer, computer visualized image viewed from an impossible location at an impossible angle. Uh, this might well be, as in this case, a, a sort of abstract 
napkin sketch by the genius. Or it could be a kind of utterly banal bit of sort of capitalist symbolism. It might look like flower petals or strings of pearls or rolling hills or you know, or whatever. Uh, it will inevitably be fluid or dynamic, even if it will never actually move. Uh, any shape, basically, is possible. The technology now exists to make it happen. All you need to do is pass it on to the engineer, who will use their software to figure out how it will all stand up. So what we now have as a paradigm for the relationship of architecture and, and structure to engineering is a near total disassociation. So th this is kind of this is not constituting some kind of new form of space for the digital era, as many people would, would suggest. Um, I would suggest that there already is a precedent for this kind of thing. Uh, another period in architectural history, the proliferation of styles and approaches, uh, the disassociation of the formal qualities of the architecture and the structural qualities, and the confusion of having so many aesthetic options open that are all equally valid. Um, this, at this, at this kind of agonized freedom um, and the kind of academic aesthetic systems. All of these points are very typical uh, of um, late 19th century design culture, eclecticism, and things like that. Um, there are strong, uh, it's a strong, uh, strongly redolent of that. But to reverse this slightly, during that period of late 19th century eclecticism, it is also the period, of course, when the proto functionalist architecture of iron and glass buildings, the construction of those buildings was at its peak at that time. So at that point, compared to the kind of dominant uh, eclectic masonry structures, these things, what would later become the, the, the sort of functionalist architecture was uh, appeared fragile and weak uh, against this kind of monumentality. People thought it would blow away, people, people couldn't really deal with railway stations. Uh, uh, winter gardens and so on. Yet at, at that very same time, it was the most advanced technology that there was. So, to look at uh, Dormana's work here, it, it, what it falls short of properly is, is expressing uh, a kind of radically melancholy aspect of uh, the monument to the Third International, which of course was once described as being made of iron, glass, and revolution. Um, the sort of willful yet impossible. Uh, ambitiousness of Tatlin's Tower, which was both rigorous and frail, um, has been described, and I'll quote this is from a, a critic, Brian Dillon, the more we learn about the tower, the more it seems that it was not a monument at all. It was instead a constellation of inspiring fragments dispersed across the century by an artist who dared the future to build something out of the ruins of his dream. So, what we argue here is contra the, the counter to the um, the orbit, uh, Tatlin's Tower is a, is a perfect example of, of, of what, following Benjamin, you, know, you would describe as a kind of abstract ruin. Uh, in Benjamin's studies, he manages to bring together cultures of 19th century modernist engineering, um, the arcades and so on, uh, as well as 18th century ruin culture. And of course, and famously, he links these two together via uh, his readings of allegory and so on. So. We should stress that the, the monuments of the Third International, um, the sort of simultaneously powerful yet futile aspect of that, in terms of its kind of impossible monument and its impossible the, the in, in, impossible engineering of its monument, it's suffused with a kind of melancholy that is kind of shorn of a kind of comforting melancholy. It's a kind of, uh, you might call it an, an injunctive failure uh, in many ways. Uh, and so that represents a kind of weakness, a point of failure in the, in the functionist narrative, which, as I've said, is a narrative that still governs the creation of artifacts such as the orbit. So just to kind of reverse once more and kind of bring it to the end. Um, the orbit, um, while redolent of various of the famous um, engineering stroke sculptural structures of the past, is actually performing little more than a kind of hollowed out that charade of what it would actually mean to be a genuinely um, successful and powerful and perhaps revolutionary work of public sculptural art. 
Uh, so rather than being a monument to uh, the Olympics or a monument to any of its creators or even a monument to recession, it's more in a way uh, a monument to the kind of inability of uh, making an appropriate monument uh, at, the, at the present time, basically. So and that's, that's the end. Thank you. Questions, comments. We now have maybe time for two or three uh, questions. Then uh, we'll pause for 10 or 15 minutes before the honest lecture. And after the honest lecture, you can also ask questions. Actually, <coughs> I was uh, I'm thinking whether, uh, uh, sorry, you know, uh, sorry, in, in the discussion about the construction of the tower, uh, at any time, um, the question of the race of uh, I'll pop that. Because you have um, the man who's giving the steel is the Indian, mm -hmm. the man who has the idea is the Indian, mm -hmm. and then the man who designs it or makes the construction is the Sri Lankan. So it's, you know, I would not, so, and also the picture uh, you showed up, and then, of course, then you realize it, aha, uh -huh, okay, so you have three guys from the subcontinent building yeah. something there without a uh, distinct idea of what it should be. So I, I would. So I don't know if there are any reactions towards it, but I could guess that this could be something like um, Dodi al Fayed buying Herod's updated for 2000. So this would be one point, which, which, which is of course is a, is, a, is a question of legitimation why some, somebody is investing that kind of money to build something that, that you done. Absolutely. On the other side, so now maybe just coming to the to the question of um, of the um, weaknesses of the former formalism of the 10th century, now of, of this grandiose um, architecture that you labeled then the Iridian or post Iridian. I'm not sure now that, that, that this is so, that this is at least then so triumphalist as we would like to be uh, being against it. So it's maybe because uh, you know that, for example, of course, that, you, for example, Frank Gehry has. Uh, Backed off uh, 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 for the construction of the Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and there was a huge discussion also uh, in the critical inquiry, which was just about going about the points you have made. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that this is so that this um, this kind of organicist deridianism uh, made possible by the by the incredible software those people use to build this kind of construction, that this kind of discourse is so triumphant as we would like to be or as we project to be. So I'm really not sure. Good point. I would, I would say, hmm. say a couple of things. Uh, one is that in all that I've read, there has been not one mention of race in any channel uh, about the other, which is interesting because, yes, in, 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 in many senses, uh, two Indians and a Sri Lankan involved in, in a sort of four-person team, um, and with Boris Johnson, who also has a reputation for making uh, rather, uh, let's be gentle and say insensitive comments about race. Um, but strangely enough, that's not coming to it. But you're right, there is, you, you may well be able to... Uh, Lakshmi Mittal definitely has uh, previous uh, in terms of him trying to assert himself as part of the British elite. So yeah, there's definitely that. Um, I agree that there is. A, I agree that there is a problem uh, with the kind of um, uh, how do you how do you uh, kind of react to a, a, a culture um, that kind of p presents itself in a kind of weak state, uh, which I think is much less from architecture, much more from kind of uh, bad fine art in the last sort of fifteen years. The kind of um, it's much less of an architecture problem. But yeah, I, I agree that, that that's, you know, how do you antagonize against something that claims to be doing some kind of self critique? Yeah. Although perhaps Frank Gehry is not a very good example because he's a very, it's interesting, like, he, of all that kind of uh, world uh, of kind of global superstar architects, he's the one with the, he's the most erratic, he's, the, one of the least intellectual ones, which I'm not, I'm not saying that in a pejorative sense, um, but he's, he, um, but also he's, you know, pr proud of uh, being able to bring buildings in on budget. He's also 
but then at the same time he never talks about politics, but then it has been one of the only architects in that milieu to actually make a political stand about an unpleasant uh, kind of situation, unlike say Zaha Hadid, who will work for anyone, and had to lay off 80 staff from our London office because the Libyan market collapsed. Um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean Gary's a Gary's a bad, ex a sort of difficult example because he's quite contradictory. Mark? Yeah, not not really a question. Just a, 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 um, I don't know what a, what a uh, well this this combination of uh, monstrous prog kind of uh, pomposity. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, and, and, and this uh, performance of Derrida and uh, self-critique and uncertainty, it, just, it seems to me, it, it is absolutely emblematic of the, of the current moment, and it, it, it is this, then uh, exactly this negative monument to, to, to with, where you've got the, the, the kind of the ambition to monumentality, together with the, the, the um, complete incapacity to deliver anything worthy of that. Then, with the, the further excuse of um, uh, of this crappy self-critique, really. And, um, so I, I don't know, I just wonder, wondered about that, like, what you think of the combination of that pomposity and, 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 and the Derrida inside. What, what, what is that about, really? Well, I mean, I'm a kind of very on a very kind of pragmatic level, and the way these people work is that they are the way the the way these processes go is that they um, they are seduced by their own abilities, and then at the very end, as part of the PR, the kind of default mode of PR has become this kind of oh, we're subverting something or other, maybe, and so on, yeah. and that's and that's and that, and that comes from both architectural culture and fine art culture. Um, Famously, you know, architecture's had a number of kind of phases of critical theory mania uh, at the kind of academic level over the last 20 years. Uh, a Dendian phase, then a Deleuzean phase, and then a Latrudian phase. Uh, and, you know, who knows um, what, what, whether, what, what will be next. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, this kind of language uh, is almost like oil that just and lubricates it, its passage through the kind of um, layers of, of, of dissemination through PR media and so on. And so you, 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 have, you have your object, it's been designed, then you oil it with some, uh, some art speak jargon and, and send it on its way and have it disseminated. And that's especially worsened by the rise of blogging uh, or, or the design blog as a way of disseminating new ideas uh, whereby Press releases are literally just copied and pasted onto onto things, and then hundreds of thousands of people look at it and go, yeah, or yeah, um, and that's about the level to which people assess things on at a lot of time. But there isn't, but isn't there something about this where the actual that PR, PR Derridanism is actually built into the actual form of the form of the thing in a way that it it it, it sort of is in the most crass sense sort of deconstructed. Um, I suppose. I, I would suggest, you know, because I, I think that Anish Kapoor, and he's been very silent actually in the press. I would, I would be silent. <laughs> yeah, literally. He's, he's, he doesn't turn up to the press things. Since this has been, I mean, the earliest images, and you can see it there, involve, a, um, involve an Anish Kapoor tube, uh, which you might recognize from some of his works. That doesn't seem to be part of the project anymore, and he doesn't take part in things. So there's a, there's a strong suggestion that. He maybe came into the came into the Cecil Bowman's office twice while it was being developed and went, oh maybe we could colour it red maybe or something. <laughs> like, Great idea, you know, that kind of thing. But it definitely seems that it was a bunch of engineers getting carried away with uh, the the ability to twist things, um, basically. Uh, but, but I mean, uh, yeah, you could definitely make that ring. But I, 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 would, I, would, I would suggest that it's it's. It's being seduced by one's own abilities, but being unable to think what what the appropriate expression of these abilities is. You know. um, just as an, as an, maybe just um, uh, that just popped up uh, now. Maybe the um, maybe it's 
also a kind of, of theoretical fig leaf or, or some, uh, some, some, uh, some sort of compromise formation uh, for, for those um, from the artistic side because they, if, if they uh, participate in this kind of, of um, tri triumphalist uh, neoliberal architecture all over the world mm -hmm. But in the, at the same time, these people perceive themselves as part of a tradition which at least uh, um, uh, which draw part of its of its uh, pathos from from the idea of being being critical or, or being. Well, there is there is this strong strong tradition uh, in that sense, like uh, the, the the artistic avant-garde. Uh, it, it links with with the political with uh, politically avant-garde ideas, and then instead of uh, just being. Um, uh, uh, openly, well, participating in, in some sort of uh, triumph uh, triumphalist architecture which celebrates um, uh, uh, technological uh, capability uh, for itself, like a demonstration of, of strength and, and, uh, and all this necessarily linked to financial strength also, I mean, uh, it, it's spectacular and, and in that sense, so that these people, um, in a sense, uh, need to, to justify, uh, to, to justify uh, uh, their participation in, in that kind of, of um, of uh, more or less obscene uh, tr uh, triumph uh, triumphalism, um, but by trying to well to, to co-opt or to, uh, to to draw from that that that's, um, critical tradition, and uh, Derrida seems well yeah. a part of that. I, I would definitely agree, uh, and a good example, a good thing that backs you up on this is that um, this is obviously now the, you know the. This is obviously the, the tallest sculpture in, in the UK, but the second tallest sculpture in the UK, in, uh, which was built a few years ago, is a sculpture that was anonymously funded uh, on the campus of one of the campuses of Nottingham University, which is famously one of the most neoliberal universities in the UK. Uh, it famously persecuted a student who was arrested for downloading uh, um, a document off the American government website. Uh, and anyway, um, it, the, anyway um, it's, it's vicious and horrible. Uh, but um, they, the Nottingham, Nottingham University built this sculpture uh, designed just by an architect without artists' involvement. And it was literally a big red spike of about 50 metres high. Uh, and they called it a spire. You know, uh, you know see what they did there. That was um, quite a photo, incidentally. But what's interesting is that without artist involvement, you know, you, you do get pure triumphalism, and that would that would sort of back you up there, and, and, and you just have a spike that, that that you know costs forty million pounds, and you know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I would, I would I would agree. I think there's evidence to back that up as well. So now we can have a break for let's say, 10 minutes and I'll do it all